yourself a chance. That's the series. Give yourself a chance. I believe that we are guilty of not looking out for ourselves. God's principle of giving is linked to getting something to you. Now, I'm going to read this to you, now Luke 6, 638. And what I'm going to read to you is from the Message Bible. I'm going to read it to you that way first, and I'm going to read it to you the old-fashioned way in New King James. Here's what it says in your notes. Give away all your life. Give away your life, rather. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, read this with me, please, come on. Giving, not getting is the way. Generosity begets what? Generosity. That's Luke 6, 38. Now, that's the way the Message Bible says, the modern version. Here's the old King James. Give, and it shall be what? Given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together, and what? Running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So there's a message here. This is normally the offering verse. When people want to motivate you to give, they read this. This sermon is not about that, but I'll just say this about this verse. It's how I live. I am a giver. I don't know what you claim to be, but I claim to be a giver. I claim to be a person who understands the power of measuring out because the way I measure, I give God, you know, this much, that's how much I get back. And if I penny pinch with God, then he penny pinch with me. <laughs> same measure. Come on, say the same measure. same measure. Same measure you use. And so that's why I don't. I honor God first with my tithes. When I get paid, I honor God first. He's the first check I write. I just, I'm just, I'm determined. Sometimes, you know, if I'm not careful, it might be the second, but I try to make it always number one. You know, you get the tweet and text. I, you know, you text, text your bills now. If you ain't careful, you hit the wrong button and, and something else get in front of him. I said, no, I want to make sure I do you first. I just want, I want to make a statement. I, I, I'm like that. I want to make a statement to my wife that she's first. I, I think that's one of the best things I've done in my marriage. There's something about making my kids feel that they're important. They have a place in my life. The church is not first in my life. And I made that a point, and it will never, that will never change. Say, so what's your order? Well, it's God. Then it's me, then it's my wife, then it's my children, then it's the church. You say, wow, what kind of list is that? And how you get to be above your wife? Well, you know, on the plane, they tell you, right? <laughs> they put the oxygen on who? Yourself first. <laughs> now, you know why they tell you that? Because if you put it on them first, and, and, and you see what I'm saying, you pass out, then they say, what's wrong? Then they pass out, and everybody did. Put it on yourself, then, hey, okay, let me help you. As long as I'm breathing good and I'm healthy, Diane, we're healthy, baby. If I'm a little crazy, then we're going to both be crazy. So I need to be okay myself. So I take care of Ricky. I get up and work out for who? That's right. That's for me. That's so I can be strong, so I won't be. I'm telling you, I have to fight it every day. It's a fight. But I'm determined. I said, Jesus' name, get them legs up, boy. Come on, son. Come on, get it up. Go back, go sideways, do something, because otherwise... You go down, can't get back up, praise God. Give myself some time to work out, give myself a longer, healthier life. Give myself some savings money, give myself dignity when I got a crisis. And I had some crisis. You know, lightning struck, struck my, my um, sprawler sprinkler system? Yeah, the preachers. I look up there and say, come on, God, now wait a minute. I'm working for you. Lightning done struck my stuff. And then, you know, I have homeowners, but it was right below the, the, the limit. So I had to pay that. Yeah, right below the deductible. I had to not, so I had to pay that cash. But see, God is so good. I believe if you give, God will bless you. Come on, say amen. God will, come on, God will work it out for you. Come on, say give, and it shall be given to you. Give you a quick testimony. So um, my, air, my air conditioning went out at my house. Downstairs, my wife called me. I was out of town. She said, "Hey, you know the air conditioning's out." I said, "Air conditioning, the heat, the heat was out." Now, cold snap we had a little while ago, 
And she was in the house shaking. I said, well, well, well you're hitting wrong. You're not pro- doing it right, baby. So I said, let me tell you how to do it. So I'm, and she said, I did everything you said, and it's still not working. So I come back home, uh, and, I, and I came back home a day early, and I was planning on coming back home. And um, I got to the thing, and I said, well, something wrong with this thing. And so I called a man, and uh, now I came back home a day early. God, you heard me say that? So I came, and I punched the thing, and I called a guy. He came out the next morning. And he said they came with his assistant, you know, and they're looking at it. Oh, Evan. That's a bad sign. You know, they say that. <laughs> so, oh, your motor gone. I said, oh, that's what I said, too. Oh, you wanted to be a fuse. You know, you always pray, Lord, let this be a fuse in Jesus' name. It wasn't a fuse. It was motor. So he said, oh, that's a lot of money, a lot of money, Reverend. So I said, it's under warranty. He looked at the thing. He said, oh, you know, you got one more day. Yeah, Lord. I'm glad I came home early. Thank you, Jesus. One day. He did it one day. Whoa, give and it shall be what? Give it unto you. I believe God said, get on home, boy. You better go home. I'm telling you, go home. You better go home now. Go home. <laughs> get in the car. Get on to the house. That's a blessing. If you're lazy, you stay here, you're going to miss it. It'd be shame to hear, oh, you missed it by day, Reverend, missed it by one day, one day. Oh, man, that's a blessing. I'm just saying, God, you know, God is just so good. I just believe when things are out of my price range, God's going to lower the price. I believe that. Come on, amen. I believe that. God's going to bless me. Here's why. Because I give. And the Bible says it shall be what? Given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And I love the fact that this is a great verse, but here's what I believe is, is, is missing. When people read this, that's all they talk about. And I think they miss a very significant point. The whole point of giving is to help you. And so I believe that beyond giving money, there are things you can do that can help you. If you give yourself to certain investments in terms of your time going to school, for example, you give yourself a chance to have a greater opportunity if you invest in certain things early in your life. What I'm doing today is only because I, years ago, did some things, made some investments. I gave something to myself. And, and that's why I'm able to do this today. If I had not given that to myself years ago, I would not have had this opportunity. And so here's the big question for today. Are you giving yourself a chance by being nice to the future you? T.D. Jakes made this statement. It was powerful. He said, he said, you know, inside of you there's an old person. And that old person one day is going to be the person. What are you doing today to help that older person? When that older person can't work as many hours and doesn't have the same opportunities, are you saving money? Are you building a future? Are you taking care of your health? So that that older person will benefit from what this younger person has done. Now, you've, I'm already old. If you're 60, 80, you won't be old when you're 60, when you get 80. Amen. Come, on, come on, say amen if you hear what I'm saying to you. Stop talking about how old you are because five years from now, you're going to be older. You pray, right? And you would appreciate five years from now. Some of you wish now, your knee hurting. If you five years ago had done some stretching, it wouldn't hurt as bad. And so understand, the, the you back there was not nice to you that's here now. So here's the big question. Are you going to give yourself a chance in the next 10 years to have a better life? Are you going to create something? Now, this month we talk about giving yourself a better chance. Next month we're going to show you how to build a better chance. There are ways and things you can do that can make everything different. That's why this series is so important to me this year. This series talks about how to build a future. You build a future by giving yourself a chance. I'm not talking about anybody but you today, just you. I want you to think about yourself and your future and your life. Are you going to do this? Are you going to give yourself a chance to have a better relationship, a better life? Or are you going to wait for somebody else to do it? You want to go meet somebody and you think they're going to make your life better, as if, it, as if that's their assignment. I always say to people, nobody's planning for your success. Have you figured that out yet? 
Name the person who's planning for your success. What's their name and address? Who's planning to make you better? Who's planning to fix your life? Who is it? Oh, oh it's God. Okay, so I'm going to pray to God and make this God's responsibility. Really? I love something else. I'm sorry. This is a book called Soar that Jake's wrote that I love. And it's a comment in there. He says, he says, Christians misunderstand that God does not make toys and furniture. He makes trees. You make the furniture. And you're praying for God to make furniture, and he doesn't make furniture. He doesn't design furniture. He's never designed uh, any furniture. You designed the furniture. That's why he gave you a mind. And there's something about you understanding the power of that, the power of saying, I personally have a responsibility to create something for my future. I have to, this is my job, not God's job. But here's what I believe happens. Certain things can come into our lives and throw us off, and we absolutely lose our way. We can't find our way. One event, one tragedy can uproot our faith, and we lose our way. And for some of you, that's been the case. You have given up on striving for anything because something happened to you. And you, and you lead off with that in conversations when you deal with people. And as if somehow that really matters much to your future. It, it, it's, it's part of the story, but it's not going to change anything. I want to show you in Ruth today. We're going to take a journey for four weeks. We're going to study one book of the Bible. And I want to show you four amazing truths from this book that will help you give yourself a chance. Here is the bottom line of the whole book. You ready? Look at the preacher for a second. Ruth is going to run upon a tragedy that looks like she has no future. But she makes a decision that gives her a chance to have a future. Whatever happened to you may be horrible. It may have hindered you and slowed you down. But I want to tell you today that you serve a God that can give you another chance. Amen. Come on, shout amen. I believe it. So there are four things in this study that we're going to talk about. Four ways you give yourself a chance. You give yourself a chance, number one, by giving to God and giving to yourself. Can you say it with me, please? Come on. Giving to God and giving to yourself. Honoring God. And honoring yourself. But understand, they work hand in hand. You cannot just pray and say, God, I'm giving to you and you are responsible to do everything else for me. That is not how it works. You are involved in this process. You're going to watch Ruth take charge of her life. She's honored God, honored her husband, honored all she can. But now she's going to make some crucial choices that's going to give her a future chance. The next time we're going to talk about this. You give yourself a chance by letting the right people have input in your life. It is all about who talks to you. You have no chance of success talking to those people. As long as you hang in this crowd or that go to that place, there is no way you have a chance to succeed. Here's how you know it. Because the people you're around have not succeeded. You go into the same porch, having the same conversations about the same junk, and that's why you have the same issues in your life. It's when you stop doing this that you'll get that. And when you stop doing that, you'll have something in your hand that you can now ch you can celebrate. There's something about coming to that place where you look at input in your life. And then thirdly, I want to show you that you give yourself a chance by making love relationship choices the right way. Most people, when they make love relationship choices, they make it out of emotion and a moment. Oh, you move me. <laughs> and it's all this excitement. Anybody can go to the gym and exercise. Now, I'll let you meditate on what I mean by that. <laughs> Anybody can go to the gym and work out. Anybody can sweat. But not everybody can be a husband and a wife and be faithful and be true. Amen. Can we say amen if you're hearing me? Some of you are going to say he was doing so good, and he was talking about love, and then he started talking about exercising and going to the gym. What do you think he was talking about? Pray about it. Anybody can do that. 
that is no indication of any long-term success. If you track a lot of your pain, it was in the moment you made that choice. It's what all the music is about. You broke my heart. You crushed my heart. You're not honest. I'm walking out on you. You left me. It's all about love relationships. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn from her how to make that kind of relationship and give yourself a chance. And I want to say this again. I want you to think about what I'm saying. Look at your love choices and ask yourself, what kind of chance do I have with this kind of choice? What kind of chance do I have? Some of you are saying, you're talking about my wife, not my, my husband. <laughs> now, that's another sermon. <laughs> but you would admit that the, the way you're choosing to manage your love relationship and your marriage, what kind of chance do you have of raising sane kids? What kind of chance do you have of being at peace? What are you creating? A crisis for generations to come. That's another sermon. Then lastly, I'm going to show you that you, you give yourself a chance by believing in your ability. Read this with me, please. Come on. Believing in your ability to bounce back from what? Disaster. You've got to believe you can get over your mother's death. You've got to believe you can get over your father's death. You've got to believe that you can get over what happened to you. You've got to believe you can get over your loss. If you don't, I can, encou- I can counsel you all day. I can spend hours with you. And there are times I, I lovingly tell people, listen, there, come, there comes a moment when you've got to decide. I know. You can live in grief and sorrow and pity all your life, or you can decide to give yourself a chance. You can make every new guy you meet be, be, the, be the fall guy for the last three guys you dated. You can make every, every job. You can blame everybody. You can blame every race. You can blame every woman, every man. You can blame anybody you want. Or you can stop that and say, I'm going to give myself a chance. Can you lift your hand with me, please? I want you to declare with me, please. Say, I, I must, must give, myself give myself a chance. A chance. Look at me. There is no chance you'll be a teacher unless you go to school for it. There's no chance. There's no chance. Listen to me. I'm going to prophesy something to you. There is no chance that I am going to be in the Olympics. (laughs) And if they put me in the Olympics and they put me on the basketball team and they make me the point guard, there is no chance they're going to (laughs) win. Pole voting. If they put me out there. There is no chance. If they put me in the Olympics and we're about to swim and I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, they, they ahead and, they, and I'm about to jump in, you can prophesy they were about to lose. <laughs> this, is, this gold medal is gone right now. It's gonna, Pastor Rick, he, he ain't going to make it. You're laughing at me, but the same is true for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're laughing at me, but you're, the, you're in the same boat with me. None of us are qualified. And here's the point I'm trying to make. The reason I'm not qualified because I didn't prepare. There's no chance. And how could you possibly think there's a chance? And you're not doing what it takes to prepare. It's unfair to pray and ask God, help me win the Olympics. Can't even swim. You have to be honest about that. And there's something about coming to that moment and saying, all that I'm praying for and all I'm talking to God about, there's no possible way this can happen. Let me give you five things, five ways that I believe you give yourself a chance. And we're going to look at after tragedy as our focus today. Because in our study in in Ruth chapter 1, it's filled with tragedy. Here's what happens. First of all, no, let me just read the five things for you first. Well, look at verse 1. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. What was there in the land? Amen. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Mahalon and Shilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. Where are they from? Bethlehem, Judah. Where are they from? Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Judah. That's where they're from. And the Bible says, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now, they went there because of a famine. So it's a smart family move. You know, there's no food. There's no job. So they're trying to survive. 
So they moved to this place where there's food and provision. Well, things always run out. Watch what happens. Then Elimelech, Naomi's son, husband, died. What did he do? Died. died. Pause for a moment. He died. What is that like? You know, you can read it. I deal with it all the time, every week, really, in my job. And there are two this week. And what's amazing is, in the middle of it, you pause. And this is final. And she was left and her two sons. Well, at least you got your two sons. You got two sons. Then, of course, then they took wives, verse 4, of the, of the women of Moab. The name was Ophrah. Ophrah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about how many years? Ten years. Ten years. Wow. No, no, no children, though. No. But that's okay. We believe, you know, it's going to be okay. At least we got two. Got four people in my life now. But then the Bible says that they died. Both Melan and Shilion both died. And the women survived her two sons and her husband. That is amazing. Now, here's what happens when that happened to her. Three things. Number one, she lost, they lost their relationship, connection. She's now lost her sons, her husband. The relationship changed. Death does that. You don't visit as much. It's not the same. Then they lost their resources. Now the, there's no guy, you know, so in this culture, without a guy, you know, there's no job, there's no inheritance. This is horrible. And then thirdly, this is important, they lost their roots for the future. Say roots, roots. for the future, which means what hope do we have in the future? There's nothing left. The guys have died, and so now we've lost everything, so what do we do? Do we have a dream? Well, there's no chance that staying here will work. There's no more hope here. There is no, there, I have no chance to succeed anymore. No husband, no house, no job, no future. So what do we do? Have you ever been to the place where you suddenly lost everything and you had to start all over again. Imagine, you got to leave your house, you got to do everything, you got to leave, leave, leave. Now, watch this. Look at me for a second. Watch the preacher. I thought I'd write down some statistics about death that will help you see how powerful this is. Did you know that in the world, 1.3 million people die in mortal crashes each year? That's 3,287 a day in the world. Every year, 3,200 people a day die in some kind of car crash suddenly. So in the world, people go through what she's going through. In the world, 1.3 million people face this. More than half, now watch this, an additional 20 to 50 million are injured or disabled suddenly in a car crash. More than half of all road traffic deaths occur among young people who are under 44, from 15 to 44. Half of those deaths are in that age bracket. Young people, suddenly, families tragically affected by this loss. In the United States, it's 37,000 people die in road crashes each, each year, and that's 100 a day. Imagine that. An additional 2.35 2 million are injured every year in America. Over 1,600 children. Over how many? 1,600 children. Over 1,600 children under 15 years of age die each year in a car crash. Now imagine how it feels for those families, and some of you know people, I know people that this has happened to, where 8,000 people are killed in crashes involving drivers ages 16 to 20 every year. I know people who've been injured, disabled, all of that. I know my own stories, and I've pastored long enough to see this happen, and I'm telling you, it's amazing. So here's, what, here's what's amazing to me, how Ruth responds to it. She models for us a moment when you feel like you have no more chance. Nothing, no future, no hope. So what did they do? Secondly, watch what happens. I've learned something from her. You give yourself a chance when you look for a new fruitful place. The first thing I want you to notice is in, in a list of five ways to give yourself a chance. Notice, first of all, that you give yourself a chance when you can see beyond your tragedies. Can you sit up with me, please? When you can see beyond your tragedies, you must see beyond it. 
Secondly, you give yourself a chance when you look for a new fruitful place. I put in bold print so you can't miss in your notes. Where is your bread now? It's no longer here. Can you have that honest moment and say, this industry is dying. This approach is dying. This way of dealing with people. All these things have changed. Watch what it's said here. It's important. Verse 6. Then she arose in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. She arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in, in the country of Moab that the Lord has visited the people by giving them bread. She would heard it's time to go back home because I can't stay here. I love the fact that she admitted this is not a fruitful place. You don't have a chance until you admit that. Until you can admit this attitude doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work. People sometimes tell me, you're disciplined. No, I'm desperate. I'm desperately determined not to be foolish again. It has nothing to do. I don't feel like I'm some monster disciplined guy. I'm not. I'm a guy struggling like you trying to get it all done. I just desperately don't like certain things. And because I don't, I don't do those things. And so there's something about her saying, listen, this is not working. Some people can't come to that conclusion. You want to give yourself a chance? Be honest like this lady. Number three, I learned that you give yourself a chance when you can have courageous family discussions. Can you sit up with me, please? Come on. Courageous family discussions. Ah, we need to have a courageous discussion about our new reality. Here is our new reality. Before I read the verse, your kids are about to go to college. Let's have a courageous discussion about debt, about what a can and can't do, about where my my boundaries are. Let me not pretend I'm some rich person with a whole bunch of cash. Here's what I've got in the bank, a thousand bucks. And here's what I've got that I can offer you. You know, here's the truth. Lay it out. Let's be honest for a second. Let's have a courageous discussion. And there's something healthy about that. There's something that's that's liberating when you come to that moment. I want you to listen to this conversation, verse 7, Ruth chapter 1. Therefore she went from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go return each to her mother's house. The Lord dealt, deal with you, deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. You guys are great. You need to go back home. Verse 9. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. I hope you get married again. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Verse 10. And they said to her, look at verse 10. Surely we will do what? Return with you to your people. We're going to go with you. Now that, that's a noble response. They were close. These were close people. Close people. Verse 11, but Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband tonight and should bear, and also bear sons, would you wait for them till they're grown? Would you restrain yourself from having a husband? Come on. No, my daughters, for it's grievous. it grieves me very much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And I want you to underline that statement. I want you to think about that. I underlined it for a reason. She has some issues with God. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to notice with me, this is a conversation that was important. Watch what happens in verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 13. You give yourself a chance when you are honest, and you cling to the right person in your life. That's number four on your list. When you are honest, in that moment when she said that to those women, they had an honest moment. And watch what happens. Verse 14 of of Ruth chapter 1. They lifted up their voices and wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. What did Ruth do? Clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law Oprah has gone back to her people, and not only to her people, but to her what? Gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, no. 
I'll read that in a minute. I want you to look, look at me for a second. In this moment, Orpah makes a, a profound statement. You're right, I don't want to go with you. You're right, I don't want to serve your God. You're right, I, I want to go back to my old life. What's powerful is they were close. Sometimes people close to you don't make the same decisions. Sometimes good people make bad choices. She made a choice to go back to her old life. But Ruth said, not me. Here's what Ruth said. This is amazing. Ruth said, entreat me, verse 16, not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, read this with me, please. Come on. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be what? My people and your God, my God, where you die, I will die, and there will I be what? Buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but what? Death parts you and me. Here's a woman who made a decision. Who you decide to cling to changes everything in your life. If you cling to the wrong people, there's no chance you will ever have different results. There is, listen to me clearly, there is no chance. I tell young people all the time, if I want to know where you're going, I look at your friends. They tell me your story. They tell me more about you than anything. You like it wild and feisty? You like it hot and heavy? You like, you like it thick and risque? You like all that and there's nothing, there's nothing in you? I'm not saying you shouldn't be feisty and energetic in life. I'm saying that there are some of us who know we live so far on the edgy side of life, so far away from God, and we like people like that. We like it. We're like her. We're going back to our old life. It doesn't take but that much to make you go back. You get back in the club routine real easy. You feel good there. Hey, what's up? You know, I miss y'all. Right. Give me, give me a shot. Double it up. Yeah, I'm going to church tomorrow. I like Pastor Rick and the Siri. Give yourself a chance. Give me another one of those. Come on, give me another chance. Give myself, myself a chance to get a DUI tonight. That's what I'm going to give myself a chance. I'm creating. See, I'm in a world. So you got to understand something. There's a, there's a difference. Listen to me. There's a difference between this and that. There's a difference between holy and unholy. There's a difference. Are you picking on the club? No. Why would I do that? I don't go club looking for my members. I don't. You do what you want to do. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. You know, I can't tell you what to do. All right, I ain't going to sing no more. But you know what I'm saying. I ain't got nothing to do with that. I'm not in charge of that. I am free from that. I'm just giving my testimony. I don't do this because I don't want that. I want God's work, to God's power to flow in my life. And I've got to make a decision. Who I cling to. Why are all your friends on drugs? Why? Why all your buddies and all the hangouts with you? Why? Everybody got something. Why? Why? Why is everybody in your life like that? Why? Pause. I'm saying that you, if you're honest, see, this is that honest conversation. This is, that's why next year the whole series is on strategic, not honest. Um, uh, oh, Jesus, what's the series on? <laughs> Courageous conversations. That's what it is. Courageous. And I want to have 12 courageous conversations with you. I believe there are things you need to talk about. Somebody needs to look at you and say, come on, be honest. Now, look, you can do what you want. I'm not judging you. I'm simply saying, if you do this, that's the result. Has that ever not been true? Has that ever not been true? If you keep talking that way to people, you have this result. You end up in conflicts all the time. You're always in some fight with somebody because you keep doing this. That's why that keeps happening. Are you connecting with me? Come on, people. I'm preaching good. You ought to hear me today. I'm talking to you. You can't make it a God issue. You can't make God the reason. You can't make this because God didn't do something. This is about you being clear. She said, I'm, I'm going to stay with you. I want what you have. I want to be like you. But there's a problem. The problem and a benefit. Here's, here's what I, I want you to know. You give yourself a chance. Last one, number five. When you know what is best for you. She, she, does, she lived with her sister-in-law. She knew. Going with her is not good. But she also understood the pain that Naomi had been through. And she sounded like it. 
See, every, every time you go someplace that's the right place for you, it's not painless. You, you, you don't always get to hang around pain-free people. L- listen to this as I close. Listen to this verse 18. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them who went, went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened that when they come to Bethlehem, all the city was excited because of them. And the women, is this Naomi? But she said to them, now listen, listen, this is so important. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, bitter. That's what Mara means. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Listen, listen to her tone. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. Boy, that's a greeting. I mean, just her tone, her way of saying things. And there's, here, in this moment, I want you to watch this. In this moment, you see the imperfections of Naomi. And this is so important because sometimes where God calls you, the people are not going to be perfect. You're not going to be in a perfect church. You're not going to be in a perfect job. You're not going to be in a perfect community or a perfect country. You, there's nothing. As long as you're there, it's going to be imperfect. But you give yourself a chance. When you look at the circumstances and the options and you say, that's the best for me. Out of all my choices, this is the best church. These are the best friends. They're not perfect. But they don't lead me to the wrong place. Naomi's not going to take me back to the crack house. Naomi's not going to take me back to my old habits. Naomi's not going to tempt me to do what I shouldn't be doing. She's not perfect. She's got some issues. But she's also got some pain. I know where her pain comes from. I watched her lose her husband. I watched her lose two sons. For some of you today, this is the beginning of a great thought. Big question is, are you allowing your pain to stop you from having a chance? Are you? Stuck in some tragedy that you have let live for years and it's dominating everything in your mind and heart and it's going to rob you of God's best. But the saddest part about it, you won't give yourself a chance. You failed. You made a mistake. There's something you're really ashamed of. You won't even give yourself a chance. Every now and then you got to stop. Defining yourself by your failures Defining yourself by your credit score. Defining yourself by your body mass. You got to stop. And you got to give yourself a chance. I love Ruth's approach. I may have had loss, but I'm going to give myself a chance. And I know where I need to be with Naomi. Because I need to do this for me. I love that part. I'm going to give, and it's going to be given back to me. Press down, shaking together, and running over. God's going to look on me, and I'm going to let the right people have input in my life. And next week, I'm going to talk about that. Hope you learned something. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word today and all that's been said. We leave this conversation with a comma. And we're going to open our hearts next week and learn the power of input. And how there's something profound that happens when the right people are talking to us. The things they say to us change our life trajectory. I praise you, Lord, for all the wonderful people around us who may mean well. But I need to really get honest and have that courageous conversation with myself. Am I really clear? Do I really know what's best for me? And do I have the courage to do it today? I lift my heart to you, Lord, thanking you for this wonderful moment. I pray for people who come here today, and they're going to leave out of here thinking, I'm going to give myself a chance. I pray that's what they say all week long. I'm going to give myself a break. I'm going to change some things so that I can give myself a future. In Jesus' name. With every head, body, every eye closed. For some of you, what gives you the biggest chance spiritually is to admit it. God, I need you. I've not been serving you. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me?
because I have not been serving God. I may be a great person, but give yourself a chance to get it right spiritually. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you raise your hand, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me because I need to give my life to Jesus. And I want you to pray that prayer for me today. Would you raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for? Say, pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. I see you. Anybody else saying, pray for me? Pray for me, Pastor. I see you. Anybody else? I see you. I see you. Anybody else? So maybe some of you saying, Pastor, I'm not saying you have to be perfect overnight, but you're saying, pray for me. And some of you that are home, the same thing. You're, you're, you're deciding, look, I need Jesus in my life. I need to start a walk with God. Father, I pray for those who are here, those that are online, and those that are on demand. May this be the moment that they make a decision to change their life direction. I just pray grace, and I pray blessing upon them. And I pray that you would prosper them today and touch them in ways that only you can. I give you all the praise, and I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Praise God. Listen, I'm so glad you came today. Are you glad you came? Come on, are you hoping you're glad you came? Praise God.